don't have anything from the top, so Sean, sure. just starts today. Uh, welcome. Um, don't look at me to... that way. Yeah, I'm gonna call you out on that dirty look you flashed me. You can go second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's meant in jest. Good as, as you might guess, we, I'm sure all of us want to start on the. Um, this issue is from the, the foreign aid workers uh, who were tragically killed in Gaza. Uh, what do you make of the Israeli uh, explanation of it? Uh, Pres uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu says it was unintentional um, and that they're investigating. Is that, is that enough at this point? Uh, what, what is the United States looking for Israel to do? So we are looking for them to do two things. One, to conduct a full, swift, and transparent investigation. And if that investigation shows that accountability is appropriate, then there, of course, should be accountability. Uh, and we will wait to see the results of that investigation before we pass judgment on it. The Israelis have said to us, and they've said publicly, that they intend to conduct this investigation swiftly. Um, we want to see it wrapped up as soon as possible um, and see them put in place any measures to prevent this from happening again in the future. And that's the, go to the second point that we think we need to see. Not just they don't have to wait for the outcome of this investigation to do it. They need to put in place better deconfliction and better coordination measures to protect humanitarian workers and to protect all the civilians on the ground. And it is something that we have consistently said to them over the past few months, is that they need to improve their deconfliction measures and they need to improve their coordination measures. <clears throat> I saw that the defense minister, uh, Minister Gallant, said that they're going to stand up a situation room to improve coordination between aid workers and the IDF. That's something that is absolutely critical. It's something that's overdue. Secretary Blinken has, in his conversations with Israeli counterparts, made the case for some time that they need to stand up something like that. He raised that with Minister Gallant as recently as last week when he was here in Washington. And so we're glad to see them do it. Should have been done sooner, um, but it's an important step for them to take going forward. But ultimately, as is, as the case, case with all of the measures they put into place, we're going to judge them on the results, not the intent. No, I mean, there's, there was, this obviously is something that's happened before, and not, not, not exactly the situation, but there was the tragedy with people uh, searching, uh, receiving aid who were killed. Uh, if you go even before October 7th, there was the investigation to the killing of uh, Shirin Abu Akhle. I mean, do you, do you think that the Israeli investigations and the U.S. responses have had an impact, particularly the U.S. responses? I mean, do you think that, the, that just saying that you're going to wait for the Israeli investigation for the Israelis to act has happened in the past? So there, there have been times that the uh, steps they have put into place because of, uh, at our urging, have had an impact and have had an impact to the, 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 the to, to have had a positive impact. For example, when the secretary traveled to Israel and pushed them to implement better deconfliction, we did see an improvement in deconfliction. We saw um, them evacuating specific neighborhoods instead of just sending blanket evacuation orders across you know, entire stretches of North Gaza. And those did have a positive impact, but they haven't been sufficient. Uh, and so um, that, that's why I made this point at the beginning, that we want to see them take, um, uh, take further steps like the ones that they, they say they're standing up. But we're going to watch, and if there are more things that need to be done, um, we will, of course, of course, call on them to do so. With respect to investigations, look, I, I don't want to pass judgment on what this investigation will show, just as you don't want to pass judgment on what any investigation would show before it's concluded. It's important that they conduct a full, transparent, swift investigation. They need to find out exactly what happened. Um, and we will, um, uh, I'll wait to pass judgment on it until it's, until it's completed. Uh, just uh, one more before I went, following up on that, but uh, I mean, the, the president himself laid out this, this aid plan uh, at the State of the Union. Uh, it was quite a, the United States was, is, was, is it, ver it, it was very visible in that, saying that, talking about the, the, the portable pier and everything. Um, what does this say about that? I mean, is this, uh, is this ruining the U.S. efforts to get aid in? I mean, obviously, it, the U.S. can still do it, but uh, tons of aid that we're supposed to go in are, have already gone back uh, because, of, uh, because of this killing. So it will not affect our efforts to stand up the pier uh, to deliver aid um, uh, through sea. That effort is ongoing. The Pentagon is working hard on that, and I know they brief on that on a regular occasion, uh, and we want to get that stood up as soon as possible. Of course, this strike does reveal the very difficult situation that aid workers on the ground inside Gaza face when it comes to act, not just receiving aid in Gaza, but then actually delivering it. So, for example, and I, I know we've talked about this quite a bit uh, over the past few months, it's one thing to get aid into Gaza, either through Rafa or Karim Shalom or through a maritime option uh, when we have that up and running. The real question is being able to distribute it, and that's, of course, um, uh, it's, it's in the distribution efforts where we saw this tragic strike take place yesterday. So it, it does, of course, raise real concerns about 
the safety of those aid workers who are doing that dangerous work. And I think it's important to remember that this, these were seven tragic deaths yesterday, but over 200 aid workers have lost their life since this conflict began. Um, so that just heighten, reiterates and heightens the need for Israel to do better going forward. And it's why the steps that Minister Gallant outlined yesterday, we are going to be watching closely to see if they are fully implemented and implemented in a way that yields better results because there very much need to be better results. And again, I come back to one point that, that we often make, and you hear, you've heard me say this, you've heard the secretary say this publicly, but this is a case that we make directly to the government of Israel. We need, they need to do better in delivering, human, in, in allowing humanitarian assistance to be delivered uh, and in uh, achieving better deconfliction and coordination measures for the benefit of the innocent civilians inside Gaza who are suffering. That's enough of a reason to do it on its own. That should be the, uh, enough of a reason to do better. But it is also in sec Israel's security interest to do better. Um, and so we will continue to press them to do that. Just one more. Is, could there be any repercussions for the United States? I mean, I know you're going to say that you're waiting for the, the result of the investigation and everything. But as we've discussed, I mean, the, we've had this before investigations. We keep seeing these, you know, we, it's, it wasn't just these seven. I think there are 200 aid workers or so who have been killed by, by some right, yeah. tallies. Uh, so obviously something's not happening. Are there more measures that the United States could, could do, could, uh, more pressure that the United States could uh, could have? So we are going to continue to say exactly what we think about this publicly. We're going to say exactly what we think about this privately. We're going to offer our best advice to them on things that they could do better. And we are going to push them to do better as we have done uh, since the beginning. Amir. Um, Matt, um, there's been reporting in Israeli media about how the attack has taken place. Basically, um, it said the drone fired three missiles in succession, <clears throat> and like each of them sort of struck uh, one of the cars. and. Uh, Reuters just, um, we have an interview with Jose Andres actually just uh, on our wire, and he told us um, that the Israeli army targeted the convoy, quote, systematically car by car. Um, and, you know, President, Prime Minister Netanyahu talked about this being a mistake and unintentional. How do you reconcile those two, the reporting and what Jose Andres is saying and what Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying? So, two things about that. So. Um, number one, the chief of staff for the Israeli Defense Forces has come out and said it's a mis it was a misidentification. So while they were, tar I took that to mean, mean while they were targeting those cars, they did not believe that it was the World Central Kitchen that was operating those vehicles at the time. Um, but that said, we need to wait and see the, the outcome of this investigation to, to know with any confidence what it was that happened, and we're going to wait to do that. But the second thing is, the second point is, it doesn't really matter how they made the mistake. At the end of the day, you have seven dead aid workers who are there trying to deliver humanitarian assistance. So whatever the reason was that led to this tragedy, whatever the, the mistake that happened inside the IDF, it's unacceptable. And they need to do better, and they need to put measures in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And given there was uh, an American citizen killed um, in this attack, why isn't the United States conducting its own investigation? So we don't conduct investigations of the type I believe you're referring to from this uh, building, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't presume to speak to any. But, I mean, could the administration consider sort of Department of Justice can do that, FBI can do I, that? Again, that we don't conduct that type of investigation from the State Department. I'm not going to speak on behalf of any other agency. And I just want to ask the evergreen question. We've reported and other media outlets have reported as well that U.S that the administration is looking at um, furthering a big uh, $18 billion aircraft package, weapons package to Israel. Um, we reported that earlier this week. Um, and looking at President Biden's statement last night saying like this is not a one-off, um, there are, and you've just talked about the number of humanitarian workers who've been killed. There are a lot of journalists who've been killed. Doesn't this kind of, like given the accusations of disregard for non-combatants uh, by the IDF, 
doesn't this kind of incident make U.S. stop and reconsider its arms sales or military aid to Israel? So let me say two things with respect to that question. Number one, with respect to some of the reporting that uh, uh, we've seen over the past few weeks about arms transfers or potential arms transfers to Israel, some of which uh, we have not officially notified to Congress um, uh, and have not moved forward on at all. But a lot of those are with respect to weapon systems that would not be delivered for years, uh, long after hopefully the conflict in Gaza uh, uh, has been resolved. It's something. But I'm not. I'm not no, entirely. No, 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 I, just, I just want to say I think it's important to to because um, it, it it does go to the exact point. It, we have had a long-standing security relationship with the state of Israel that predates this administration, that predates the current government uh, in Israel, and that has existed through Democratic and Republican administrations in Washington and through governments of different parties in Israel because we are committed to Israel's long-term security. So when I get questions and when I see some of the reporting about arms transfers or poten potential arms transfers to Israel, some of which started years ago or approved years ago, and some of which relate to systems that won't be delivered until years down the road, uh, I think it's important to put in context that those relate to our overall security relationship with Israel and our overall commitment to Israel's defense uh, against a number of adversaries that it faces in the region that are committed to the destruction of Israel. Now, with respect, with respect to the question I know that, that you're getting at, which we've addressed uh, a number of times here, uh, we continue to be committed to Israel's defense, but we continue to um, uh, press them consistently to ensure that they fully comply with international humanitarian law, and critically, that when they do make mistakes, as they very well, uh, they very obviously did yesterday, that they are transparent about those mistakes, that they investigate them, and if appropriate, there's accountability. I'm not entirely sure how the delivery date for this being down the line, four years, five years, has an impact on your decision making today, because you're making the decision today with the information that you know there are like various accusations about Israeli military's conduct in Gaza. Elsewhere, there are incidents that the State Department is looking at whether Israel has breached international rules, like humanitarian law. So I'm not entirely sure how relevant it is that the delivery of those are like down the line. But uh, regard, just one last thing. Um, you said a minute ago, um, so you talked about misidentification. Um, are you referring to uh, the video of Israel chief of staff, or are you? Correct. I mean, yeah, correct. And the also, statement he that, said publicly. Is that what Israel? Is that what you, U.S. government, have been told that it was a misidentification? They, they have told and, us. They have told us the same things privately that they have said publicly. But I mean, that they took the strike, but they didn't. They weren't aware that it was a WCK. Convoy. I am not going to. Uh, they have. Uh, they have. As I said. The thing that the, the point about misidentification that General Halevi said in that public statement is what they have communicated to us privately. Um, I'm not going to get further into the, the conversations, but ultimately, what's important is that they conduct an investigation to identify how that mistake happened, exactly how it happened, and what they can do to prevent it from happening in the future. So, Go ahead. Short follow up on that. Also, in uh, the IIDF statement, Halevi said that the misidentification was at night. Is that the understanding of the US government as well? And can you shed any light on why aid convoys are traveling at night at the moment? I don't have any reason to, to dispute that statement. Um, and with respect to aid convoys traveling at night, I think they they travel at different times during the day. But some of them, especially those traveling to the north of Gaza, where the aid situation has been uh, much more restricted, and there's been much uh, a, a, a more desperate humanitarian situation, sometimes they've been traveling at night to minimize the scenes like we saw several weeks ago where you saw uh, stampedes of desperate uh, individuals trying to rush out and, and take aid from the truck. So they've been trying to move at times uh, that would mitigate the risk of that happening. And just one. But, but I should, they also do move during the day. They don't move only at night. OK, and one on just timing. I know you say swift investigation. Can you give us any more detail whether this is days, weeks? I, I would defer to the government of Israel to speak to that. We want to see it happen as soon as possible while ensuring that it is, is thorough and gets to the actual bottom of what happened. Just one more on this and then um, a question on the Benny Gantz comments from today. Um, so has the government of Israel shared with you any information that proved that this was what they're saying, a misidentification? Or are you just trusting that? They, what we are trusting is that they're going to conduct a full investigation. But that said, 
We will look at how that investigation is conducted. We will look at the results of that, and then we will pass judgment on it. So I don't want to um, pass judgment on anything that they have said privately or publicly until they've conducted a full investigation. And I only say that because as is true with our own military, as is true with militaries around the world, oftentimes the early events of what happened don't bear out when you conduct a full investigation uh, into the underlying facts. So we're going to wait and pass judgment when we see the full results. But in a way, you're passing judgment by standing up there and saying it was a misidentification already before you have the actual facts before you. I don't have any reason to dispute that, but we will pass. We will. We will wait and see the full invest, in, investigation. Okay. Um, uh, Benny Gantz, Israeli War Cabinet Minister, um, said today that he would call for parliamentary elections in September. What is the U.S. response to that? Would you support such elections taking place? That is entirely a decision for the Israeli people and the Israeli uh, uh, members of, of uh, Israeli government to make. Yeah, go ahead. But when you're talking about three strikes uh, on this convoy, I mean, even if we take at face value that there's misidentification. I mean, is that appropriate? I mean, you have a convoy which is apparently clearly marked by aid, but if it's whoever it was in there, having three strikes, they're systematically destroying it. Is, do you think that's a, that's that's a, an appropriate way to go? I, you know, I, I it's hard to comment on that without getting into a hypothetical. You could obviously see a scenario if there were, th uh, uh, you know, a convoy of clear of clear terrorists that it might be uh, appropriate. That obviously was not the case here. So I think. We will wait, as I said, for the results of the investigation to pass judgment uh, on, on, uh, on how this mistake happened. But as I said, it ultimately doesn't matter whether it was um, three or two. They killed seven aid workers. However they made the mistake, it resulted in a tragedy that should have never happened, and that's what they need to prevent from happening again. Yes. Thank you. Uh, on the investigation, uh, Matt, do you believe that Israel's record uh, in investigating itself is a good record? They have come up with good results in the past. I mean, there have been, there's been so many investigations. Can you cite one investigation where they actually came clean? So they have spoken to a number of investigations, including one where you had um, uh, members of the IDF who behaved inappropriately inside a mosque, and they spoke to those members being right. disciplined. They have uh, spoken to a number of other investigations that they have ongoing. Uh, I, I uh, read comments uh, last week from the chief lawyer inside the IDF who talked about a number of ongoing investigations they have. But ultimately, let's just wait, see mm -hmm. what the investigation comes up with, and then we can make our judgments. Okay. Now, uh, I have a couple more. Just bear with me. On the misidentification. So. When they say misidentification, does that tell us that they were actually after three car convoy that had Hamas fighters in it and they were targeting? Or, you know, I mean, a movement of fighters by cars, which is obviously unusual, and so on. Is that, is that what you think they meant? I, do, I don't know what they were after. And ultimately, as I said, it doesn't really matter what they were intending to do because what they did do was kill seven aid workers, and it's right. unacceptable and should not happen again. Okay, so, you know, there's been uh, about 196, I believe, 196 aid workers killed in Gaza, 175 UN workers, uh, including uh, UNRWA workers and so on. So I want to ask you, do you believe there's any kind of, you know, what is different about this strike? Uh, the fact that this particular strike uh, was, uh, you know, um, uh, owned or headed by a, a famous chef and had citizens of Canada and Australia and Britain and the United States and not just Palestinians. Is that the only difference uh, for this strike to, to garner such a great deal of space and to engender, you know, the anger of the president of the United States of America and your anger? So, Said, I won't speak to why any one strike gathers uh, more attention than others. That's a, a decision that's largely not made by the United States government. I will say, when it comes to the United States government speaking out, uh, we have talked at length about the need for Israel to do more to minimize civilian harm and minimize death to aid workers. That didn't start this week with these deaths, uh, the, this, the tragic death of these seven World Central Kitchen workers. We have talked about it for some time. and. We have pressed the Israeli government to do better and offered them ideas on how to do better. And as I said at the outset, one of those ideas was to stand up the kind of situation room that they are now standing up. Last, last question on Rafah and the meeting that took place uh, on Monday. 
uh, it seems that there are you know there are deep differences between the United States uh, of America and and Israel on the Rafah uh, invasion. Can you update us on what's going on? What 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 was the United States? Uh, what is the United States expect? Uh, does it, uh, what does the United States expect Israel to do? Because we're talking about you know movement of maybe one and a half million people. We. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can yeah. tell if you were. I was going to jump in, and sometimes I've jumped in. Yeah, you've not, you've, no, not, you've no, not been done no, with the question, so I didn't, want to, I didn't want to interrupt you. No. Uh, so with respect to a potential operation in Rafah, what we have made clear to them is we share the goal of dismantling the remaining Hamas battalions that, are, that ex exist in Rafah and do pose a legitimate security threat to the state of Israel and the people of Israel. Um, but we do not want them to conduct a full-scale operation that we believe uh, would not only uh, lead to a high number of civilian deaths and would hinder the delivery of humanitarian assistance, but would ultimately weaken Israel's security. So what we did uh, in that meeting uh, that the Secretary attended at the White House a couple of days ago is to offer them our best advice on other ways to accomplish that mission, and we will have follow-up meetings in the coming days to further that conversation. Oh. Go ahead. I'll, Thank I'll come you, to you next. Um, so you said that um, we have seven dead international aid workers, and you want to avoid seeing more killing in the future. So therefore, um, you said that you asked Israel to coordinate better and to establish deconflicting zones. But this is contradict with what exactly happened with World Central Kitchen. They coordinated with the Israelis to every detail, and they went into exactly the deconflict deconflicting zone on the beach. And yet they were targeted. So how this applies now? What they, difference does it make? That has been that is exactly the point I was making. They have had deconfliction measures. They have had coordination measures to tr to um, try to prevent tragedies like this from happening. And they haven't worked well enough. Clearly, they haven't worked well enough. When you see not just these seven aid workers that have been killed, but over 200 aid workers that have been killed since the outset of this conflict, and so. They need to do a better job. Some of this has been bureaucratic, with aid workers not talking to the right, having the right, uh, with with the IDF not having set up the right channels to communicate with aid workers and messages not getting pa uh, passed back and forth. But as I said, ultimately, whatever the 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 details are that broke down here, the result is unacceptable, and that's why they need to do better. And so that's why they need to have improved deconfliction and coordination measures to prevent tragedies like this from happening in the future. Okay. So as a result of the killing of the World Central Kitchen staff, also ANIRA, which is an American NGO, suspended their work in delivering aid to Gaza. And before that, UNRWA was targeted by the Israelis of saying there are some people who are involved in uh, the October 7 attack, and we're still waiting for the investigation. So practically, uh, three of the vital organizations that providing aid to Gaza either suspended their work or they don't have enough fund to help uh, the people who are starving in Gaza. Some people uh, believe that this actually is a, is a kind of a, a strategy on behalf of the Israelis to use food as a weapon of war and to prevent Gazans from receiving the aid and therefore forcing them to leave as a, some kind of strategy by Prime Minister Netanyahu. <clears throat> Do you see, can you entertain this for a second, this thought that actually this is not a, a mistake or unintentional <coughs> or haphazard or what accident, but actually there is some kind of thought process that get into it by the Israelis. So a few things just in the, the preface to the question first. So with respect to UNRWA, it's not just the Israel, Israeli government that found that there were UNRWA workers that participated in the, the terrorist attacks. It was UNRWA itself. And I think that's always an important thing to remember, and UNRWA itself that actually briefed the United States on its own findings. Um, with respect to UNRWA, it does continue to operate. Obviously, it's faced funding challenges, but you've seen a number of countries who have resumed their funding, and UNRWA is continuing to do important work on the ground now, vital work um, that we want to see continued. So while they have faced funding challenges, they are continuing to deliver humanitarian assistance inside Gaza, and it's critical that that work uh, continue. I, I, obviously, there are organizations that are going to look at, the, at what happened the other day now and be worried about the safety and security of their employees. How could they not be? Um, and so it, it is why it is incumbent on the government of Israel to institute better measures to give confidence to aid workers that their 
employee or to get aid organizations that their employees won't be killed just trying to deliver humanitarian assistance. With respect to the overall policy, look, I, I can just speak to what the government of Israel has said and what they have done. So they have said they want to see humanitarian assistance come in, and they have allowed humanitarian assistance to come in through Rafa, through Karim Shalom, through the 96 gate. They're working with us uh, on this maritime option that we are standing up with the, the cooperation of other countries in the region. But uh, in, in all of these circumstances, it has been not enough. It has been too little. It has been plagued uh, in many cases by bureaucratic delays and bureaucratic obstacles that we are continuing to try to work through. But it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing as I, you know, with respect to, um, uh, it's the same point I'm making with respect to these deaths. Whatever the reason the number, the amount of humanitarian assistance hasn't gotten in at the levels it should have, the ultimate fact is the fact, which is not enough food, not enough water is getting in right now, and the government of Israel needs to do more to allow it to get in and to facilitate it getting in. Go ahead. Thank you. Just want to follow up Said's questions on, uh, you know, the nearly 200 uh, aid workers uh, killed in Gaza and your, uh, you know, difference in your approach. Um, President Biden yesterday expressed outrage over the killing of uh, seven aid workers from the world's uh, central kitchen in Gaza. Uh, is the administration also outraged by the killing of, you know, nearly 200 aid workers, 100 journalists, 30,000? 33,000 Palestinians, mostly women and children. Are you outraged by this too? We are outraged by every loss of civilian life in Gaza. And you've heard the president speak to this. You've heard the secretary speak to this in saying far too many civilians have been killed. Too many aid workers have died in this conflict. Uh, too many journalists <laughs> have died in this conflict. And we want to see Israel do a better job in minimizing all of those casualties. Uh, just one more on that. Uh, Biden also in the same statement said that Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers and civilians. And you yourself said that, you know, you have repeatedly urged Israel to take some steps to minimize uh, civilian harm in Gaza. And if there are steps that Israel needs to take and Israel chooses not to take them, doesn't it mean that, you know, Israel is deliberately attacking aid workers and civilians? No, I don't think you can you can necessarily make that conclusion because there are Why? because sometimes there are bureaucratic obstacles that that are presented and we try to work through those those bureaucratic but how obstacles. How do you explain but, the killing of 33,000 Palestinians then? So Partly this is because Israel is operating in an incredibly difficult environment where Hamas hides behind human shields. They're operating in an urban environment where Hamas has constructed tunnels beneath apartment buildings, hides in mosques, hides in hospitals, uh, even hospitals that, uh, uh, like Al-Shifa that Israel had cleared. Hamas returns to those hospitals. And so it is an incredibly difficult environment, uh, and, and the Israeli Defense Forces face Real challenges, does this justify it's like, no, real challenges but I'll say it does not minimize at all their responsibility to do everything possible to prevent taking civilian life. Yeah. Tom. Uh, just to follow up on uh, the several questions about the value of investigations after actions by the IDF. I mean, you've called numerous times for investigations after Palestinians have been killed in recent years. Some of those have been U.S. citizens. In the last two years, Omar Assad, February 2022, found dead after being detained by Israeli soldiers. You called for a thorough criminal investigation, full accountability. Shireen Abu Akhla, as we know, May 2022, a U.S. citizen. You called for a full investigation. Uh, June 2023, Omar Katin, a U.S. resident in Turmasaya, which is a town full of U.S. passport holders in the West Bank. Uh, you called for full accountability and justice. Um, I haven't, you know, what, what, are you satisfied with the outcome of those three investigations for a start? And then what should we read into your call for an investigation in this case? So I can't speak to the specifics of every one of those investigations. Some of them predate some my, of them so, I say, I say, some of them predate my time here. Uh, before I was working at the State Department, I can say with respect to uh, the investigation of Shireen Abu Akla, of, co of course, um, we called on Israel to investigate, and we also called on them to cooperate with our investigation. And they did cooperate with our investigation that the U.S. Security Coordinator conducted um, that concluded that gunfire uh, from IDF positions was likely responsible for her tragic death. Um, and so there were steps that they took to, to cooperate with the investigation that we had. Ultimately, 
as it pertains to the the deaths of, and, and I should say, there are two other cases that are ongoing right now. One uh, of of American citizens who were killed in the West Bank. One that's being conducted by one investigation that's being conducted by Israeli law enforcement. One that's being conducted by Palestinian Authority law enforcement. <clears throat> and in all of those cases, we want the same thing. We want a full investigation. We want to hap it to to happen as quickly as possible, but we don't want that swiftness to come at the expense of thoroughness. Ultimately, it's important that they get it right. And then with respect to all of them, we will um, make judgments on a case-by-case -case basis on whether that investigation was conducted fully and appropriately and led to uh, appropriate outcomes and results. I mean, uh, Beth Salem, which is a you know very well-respected Israeli human rights group, uh, several years ago said it would stop cooperating with military investigations in Israel because, in its words, they are nothing more than a masquerade. Um, do you see that view? Do you have any sympathy with it? Let me just say, with respect to, uh, we're, I think we're all going to have a, a, a chance, the entire world, including the journalists in this room, including the United States government, to look at an investigation being conducted by the Israeli Defense Forces with respect to the, the, the killing of these seven world central kitchen workers. And we are all going to be able to make our own independent judgments about the thoroughness and the reliability of that investigation. Um, I know that we will do so, and I'm sure that all of you as well will as well. Yeah, yeah, stay on, Alex. I'm, yeah, well, I'll come back to you. Stay in, I'm sure stay in the region. <laughs> uh, Matt, I uh, just want to follow up on Saeed and uh, Rabia's question regarding this attack on uh, uh, WOCK uh, convoy is not an isolated incident. It's been attacks on convoys before, on honor was storage facilities, uh, people queuing for uh, aid in, in Gaza have been also targeted by the Israeli forces. Uh, and now you're calling them for an investigation, you're calling them to change some, to, to make some changes so this incident doesn't happen again. But don't you think that your, the US soft approach toward Israel in this war also led them to get away with it, for example. So you I would just do that. Oh, sorry, sorry. I would disagree with the characterization. Um, we have on a number of occasions pressed them to do more uh, on deconfliction measures, on uh, protection of civilians, and they have taken steps that have been important in most cases, nearly all cases, not enough, but steps that have been tangible and that have produced results. Uh, but we want to see them do better, uh, and that's why we'll continue to engage with them on that. On, but do you on, think it was? Regard better enough, let's say. I mean, the northern Gaza is on the verge of famine already. Uh, aids are not coming in for a while now, for months. Uh, you're pressing the Israelis' counterparts. It seems that doesn't yield results anymore. So I will say that you can look back at the history of our engagements with the government of Israel and show where it has produced tangible results. Uh, and, and that includes in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, right up into to the recent history, starting with the first trip that the Secretary made to uh, the region when he urged the government of Israel to open Rafah. And then the President came two days later and cemented that agreement to open Rafah, which allowed humanitarian assistance to get in. Uh, we then engaged with them to uh, urge the opening of Karim Shalom, which is an important step to allowing more humanitarian assistance to get in. The same thing is what led to the opening of the 96th gate in the north, the same thing that led to flour coming in through Ashdod, the same thing that is leading to the opening of uh, a, a, a maritime route to get more humanitarian assistance in. When it comes to deconfliction measures, it was our involvement that led to them to implement a humanitarian pause, not just the pause of, of, of one week, but three hour pauses with four hours notice in the early days of the war when uh, uh, they were bombing neighborhoods, oftentimes with kind of blanket notices, but not with any kind of specificity. And it was our involvement that led them to to, um, uh, to start offering those, those pauses. It is our involvement that led to them uh, offering, as I said earlier, specific neighborhood evacuation orders rather than just these blanket orders. That said, in all of these cases, we want to see them do more, and we want to see them uh, 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 do better. We want to see them to do more to let humanitarian assistance in and to prote uh, protect civilian lives. And that is why we are consistently engaged with them from the President of the United States to the Secretary of State to our team on the ground uh, uh, and everyone in, in the United States government who works on this matter. Well, ask my last question about the statement that issued by the White House yesterday and the President Biden's statement regarding this attack on K. Uh, on the latest account on the convoy, uh, the president sounded outraged and heartbroken and 
blamed Israel that they are not doing enough to protect aid workers. Does this language uh, signal a change in policy or just just a, a statement regarding this incident? Uh, it was a statement about this incident, but it's not a change in policy because we have always, as I said, consistently been uh, telling the government of Israel that they need to do more to protect aid workers and civilians and journalists. Now, we're glad to see them taking uh, additional measures now. As I said, those measures were overdue. We've been urging them to do uh, them from some time, for, for some time. But this has always been the policy that we have clearly communicated them that we want them to follow. Camilla. Matt, sorry, just one on the U.S.-Canadian dual national who was amongst those killed. Um, <clears throat> World Central Kitchen has also named him. Can you confirm if the State Department's reached out to his family and what, if any, consular support the U.S. can give? We have reached out to his family. We reached out to his family yesterday to offer our condolences and to offer uh, uh, any consular assistance that we can provide. Um, off, we, that is always our standard practice in these cases when we see uh, an American citizen um, who has tragically lost their life overseas. We um, offer any type of assistance that we can to facilitate um, uh, whatever they need um, in the wake of this tragedy. And we'll keep, obviously, the details of that private, but we have been in touch with his family. Please just make sure, stay in the region, finish it up on Gaza before. Go ahead. Gita, sorry. Thanks. In the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, regarding the uh, attack on the Iranian facility in Damascus, <coughs> I was wondering, well, we know that the United States has sent messages to Iran saying that it was not involved, it had no idea of this operation. Um, I was wondering um, what, how was the uh, American message received? Was it accepted, do you, do you think? considering that there are now a number of officials threatening retaliation? So I am not going to speak to how it might have been received. The Iranians can speak for, uh, for them themselves. I will just say that we made very clear um, to the Iranians that we had no involvement in this strike. We didn't know about it at the time. And we warned them not to use this as attack as a pretext to attack U.S. facilities or personnel. Since then, have you, has uh, the administration um, possibly followed up with uh, reaching out to an intermediary, somebody that, a country that Iran trusts, <clears throat> to hone in that message? I, I'm not going to speak to our range of diplomatic engagements, but as we have made clear uh, over a number of months, we have the ability to send messages, very clear messages to Iran, both directly and indirectly, and we do so when it's in our interest. Matt, do you know if, have you, has the administration been able to ascertain the, um, the, uh, that the facility, the Iranian facility, was indeed a diplomatic one, as Iran claims? Uh, we are still gathering uh, details about what, it, what precisely type of facility that was. And given the Iranian response uh, or threats, uh, are U.S. Uh, interests, <clears throat> troops, in the region and across the world, have they been put on alert? So I would defer to the Pentagon to, to speak to that. Obviously, uh, we have been broadly, <clears throat> excuse me, we have been uh, uh, broadly, and I'm not speaking on behalf of, of the Pentagon, but just on behalf of the State Department, broadly concerned about escalation since October 7th. And have you seen us take a number of steps over time uh, uh, with respect to our embassies? We are constantly monitoring the situation and making assessments about um, uh, the precise threat environment at, at any given day, but I don't have any updates to posture to announce. And with respect to um, uh, American forces in the region, I would defer to the Pentagon for comment. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much. Two questions, basically. Uh, first question, specifically for you being diplomat, do you think so attacking diplomatic missions and diplomats uh, in an area that is dedicated or declared a diplomatic mission? It sounds like U.S. have no condemnation on this Israeli strike. It will be another continuation for Israel, another signal to continue this effort. Because the attack where it happened, that, that location is very adjacent to other missions, like Canadian mission is very next to it. So what is your comment? We do not support attacks on diplomatic facilities. But as I said, in response to Gita's question, we're still uh, gathering information about what type of facility this was. And my other question is regarding the United States' position on the Strong spoke to Indian opposition as uh, the State Department issued many statements in the support of uh, Delhi uh, uh, Chief Minister Kejriwal and then the asset freezing of Congress. 
so it seems like united states have very strong position to uh, to condemning the uh, attempts to silence the opposition in india but regarding the political prisoners in pakistan specifically the female prisoners that are still behind the bars of our many political charges so why so strong position for indian opposition and nothing for the pakistani political prisoners so i would i would uh I would not agree with that characterization. We have made clear on a number of occasions that we want to see uh, everyone in Pakistan treated consistent with the rule of law, treated with respect for human rights, as is our position with respect to any country in the world. The female prisoners. Prim, Prim go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's been 110 days since journalist Samir Abu Dhaka was killed, 65 days since six year old Tim Najab, a family the medics had to save, were killed. Per Sean and other colleagues' earliest question, Today should be uh, Shreen Abakla's birthday, our, our Palestinian American colleague, I might add, killed in 2022. So I'm wondering if you have updates on not just the investigations, but actual accountability measures in response to these. And if not, how can this administration's approach of relegating things to months long investigations while not changing policy, um, all as thousands more are killed? be a justified approach. So I, I would say that with respect to Shireen, I did speak to that a, mo a moment ago. We right, can, but in terms can, of accountability yeah, oh, I know, I know. Well. We, we yep. condemned her killing when it happened. We still uh, condemn it now. There was an investigation conducted by the United States that found no reason to believe that that uh, uh, death was intentional, but it is a tragedy nonetheless. With respect to investigations, and, and look, this I, I, I used to have to answer questions on behalf of the Justice Department that were very similar to, to this. Um, Investigations in some cases take time. You heard me a minute ago say we want them in every case to be conducted swiftly, but not at the expense of thoroughness. Um, and that that is our position with respect to these investigations in Israel. It is our position with respect to investigations anywhere in the world, whether they impact an uh, American citizen or they involve other types of tragedies. So we will continue to, uh, uh, to press for not just full investigations, but when warranted, all appropriate accountability measures. But so, yeah, like given that approach I understand, but given again that thousands of people have been killed since these incidents I've laid out, him jobs killing, the journalists killing, like how is this justified given, and you know, as you've said yourself, like the material consequences of these things matter. The fact that seven, eight workers have been killed matters. So how can this approach continue to be justified if well, at the end of the day, what matters is thousands of people continue to be killed with a no change of policy. So there, there are two things here. I think one is with respect to investigations, and we want to see accountability measures when appropriate for people who have behaved uh, inappropriately um, in violation of IDF code of conduct or in violation of international humanitarian law. We want to see accountability um, inside the Israeli system. But it's also true that we have pressed the government to enact operational changes to, pre to prevent further civilian loss of life. And we have seen them, as I've spoken to at length, enact changes over time. Those haven't been sufficient. We have seen uh, Minister Gallant announce new changes that they're putting in place just yesterday. And we're gonna watch those and make our judgments uh, based on, on how they work. And finally, one more. Um, you know, As our colleagues have pointed out, hundreds of aid workers, doctors, volunteers have been killed even before this week. The US has cut funding to UNRWA. The World Central Kitchen is pausing operations and NARA is pausing all out of fear of their workers being killed. And you know, you think of, for instance, the Mr. Rogers quote, the infamous Mr. Rogers quote, if, you, if you're hearing me. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers, you'll always find people who are helping. I imagine, you know, you and your colleagues have come into this work, hopefully, you know, trying to be helpers too. So I wonder what's the United States' message to the helpers in the world, trying to help people in Gaza, given those helpers are being killed with American military aid. So you saw the secretary speak to this, not the, uh, with a very similar quote uh, yesterday, uh, speaking in Paris about how aid workers are the helpers that um, run into conflict to provide help to those who need it. And our message to them is what it has been throughout this conflict, that we support the work that you do, we fund the work that aid organizations do in Israel, in Gaza, all around the world, and we want to see that work continue. And we will continue to make very clear to the government of Israel that it needs to do much better to protect those workers from harm. Mm -hmm. All right, any more in the region before we move on? Just a yeah, question. we'll finish here and then I'll, then I'll take um, a few. You said that you don't expect that this attack is going to impact the humanitarian peer being set up and the support from that peer getting to where it needs to go, I assume? No, I was, what I was speaking to is the, you have to separate, when you think about the peer, you think about the same way as I think 
delivery through Rafa or anywhere else. There is both getting aid in through the pier and into Gaza. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. And then there's the delivery of that aid inside Gaza. We do not expect that it would impact the first. Of course, um, the ability of humanitarian aid workers to deliver aid inside Gaza, which is what we saw uh, uh, tragically impacted yesterday, um, uh, continues to be an ongoing concern. And so it's why it's important that the government of Israel improve uh, deconfliction and coordination measures. So could this incident delay that peer um, being up and running and getting the support to I, people? I, I would refer to the Pentagon for any comment about the timeline uh, of this peer, which you should not read into one way or the other, other than it's a project that they are managing. That's just something I've never been able to speak to from here. Mira. Just uh, to follow up on that one, actually, have you had since yesterday any conversations with any with Pentagon or with any possible humanitarian aid partners on the ground about you know how concerned they are because now it would be expected that perhaps they would look for additional measures uh, to ensure their safety and security. We've had a number of conversations with humanitarian aid organizations who. Uh, as you might expect, as you would obviously expect, are incredibly concerned about what happened. But the the sad truth is, as we've spoken to, as some, some of you have mentioned in your questions I've spoken to, these are not the first death of aid workers. Um, uh, there have been 200 aid workers that have been killed. So um, the very sad truth is that the workers doing this important work are aware of the risk because they're living with them every day and are putting their lives potentially on the line to deliver humanitarian assistance. Uh, so what, what we have heard from aid groups is they want to see the government of Israel do better, and that's what we have pushed the government of Israel. And had you picked a partner on who's going to distribute from that peer, who's going to pick it, pick it up from the peer? I, I'm not aware of any any further updates or developments on that question. It's something okay. we're continuing to work through. Just a couple of other things. Um, is it State Department's or is it U.S. understanding that there are there is already uh, famine in Gaza? You have warned of imminent risk, but is it your understanding that there is already famine in Gaza? I'm not aware of an, an assessment that there is currently famine. Now, there are places where we have um, a lack of information, particularly in northern Gaza, where it is very clear that there is um, acute food security and there is a potential for famine. Um, what's actually occurring on the ground is very difficult to know. Bottom line is there needs to be more food delivered to people who desperately need it um, because if famine is not already occurring, there are at least parts of Gaza that are on the brink of famine, and we need to get food in to those people. And two more things. Uh, Palestinian Authority wants a vote uh, at the UN Security Council in April to become a full member. Uh, does the U.S. oppose this? And if necessary, would you veto it? So I'm not going to speculate about what may happen down the road, but we have always made clear that we believe the, uh, uh, while we support the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, and you've seen the Secretary engage in very intensive diplomacy over the past few months to try to establish a Palestinian state with security guarantees for Israel, that is something that should be done through direct negotiations through the parties, it's something we are pursuing at this time and not at the United Nations. Okay. And the right. final thing is, Kirby said, sorry, um, I'm almost done. Kirby said yesterday on the podium that State Department has not found that Israel's military uh, conduct has violated international humanitarian law. His comments sounded conclusive and definitive. So I just want to follow up and clarify, does the State Department have such a definitive conclusion that it has looked at all of the incidents raised so far and you know, not, and all of the incidents and the, the, the review on those have been concluded and as a result, you have a definitive assessment that so, no violations have occurred. So I saw what the Admiral said. He also said that we have ongoing processes here at the State Department. And that, yeah, is, that, that, no, so that is correct. We have ongoing processes here at the State Department to examine that very question. And we have not at this time concluded that Israel has violated international humanitarian law, but these are very much ongoing processes uh, with respect to that question. Can I just follow up one Go. more thing on that? Is, yeah. Have, have any of those, when you're making the assessments, have, have any of those gone to the Office of the Legal Advisor? Uh, I uh, have made it clear that we are not going to talk about the specifics of internal deliberations and how we're conducting those processes. But if this but is there, it's about international humanitarian law, so it's a legal assessment. There are, and there are a number of offices inside the State Department that are involved in these assessments, but I'm not going to speak to the exact are you specifics. Are how many incidents in total are you looking at? Is a, it a, a couple a, of, is it a, dozens? A, a number of them. I'll leave it 
then. Sh I, 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 yeah. Yes, there's pressure. I meant Sean, but go ahead, Alex. I've been, I've been overlooking you for some time, so go ahead. Yeah, back to, yes, there's pressure. Uh, pressure. The Secretary seemed to uh, suggest that Russia has already received Iranian ballistic missiles and I fear, uh, has used it uh, in Ukraine. The White House yesterday couldn't confirm that. Did the Secretary mean to say that? Was it a translation error? I shouldn't, you know, mentioned that he was speaking in French. He was speaking in French, and we have made very clear that we have been concerned about uh, the burgeoning security partnership uh, between Iran and Russia. Um, the Secretary was speaking to the fact that they have delivered drones already. Thank you. I'm going to move to South Caucasus. The Secretary spoke with Aliyev today. If you look at as of January, Aliyev was venting about this week's uh, meeting uh, uh, slash Armenia summit, and he said that uh, the failure to postpone the trilateral meeting, uh, despite his concerns, he says, will lead uh, to escalation of tension uh, and ra rather than peace. Did the secretary agree with the assessment, and is the meeting still on? So um, I, with respect to that, I'm, I am going to defer to a statement that we have coming out uh, shortly. The president spoke to, I'm sorry, the secretary spoke to President Aliyev uh, earlier today, and we'll have a readout coming. Uh, uh, yeah, but about, about the particular point that the Aliyev made, did the secretary, you know, did, did that change anything? We, we will yeah. speak to that in the readout, but the meeting is, the meeting is still ongoing. All right, on Georgia, do you have anything for me on uh, Georgian governments uh, trying to uh, press, reintroduce, let's say, the Russian law? They tried it last year, they failed. It looks like they are timing it. So we've seen the, re the reports that they are considering the, uh, that potential legislation. And I would just say that last year, tens of thousands of Georgians took to the streets to make their European ambitions known and to reject the last attempt to implement this law. Georgia has a historic opportunity to open EU accession talks, and we stand ready to continue to support Georgia in that process. I have one more, if I may, on Russia uh, sanctions. Uh, it appears that uh, the administration uh, removed three of Rus Russia's sanctions uh, from the SDN list. Uh, you know, targeting VTB Bank, you know, uh, uh, subsidiaries. You guys uh, uh, imposed them two, two months ago against, you know, uh, Russian oligarch uh, because of uh, sanction violations. What is the reason for, for that decision? So with respect to that specific question, I'll refer you to the Treasury Department, but I would uh, note that we have continued to impose new sanctions on Russia, including uh, just in the past few months, and have taken measures to tighten the enforcement of our existing sanctions. Thank you. Sean, go ahead, and then I'll come to you next. Um, the Constitutional Court in Uganda today uh, struck down a bid to, um, to, to undo the anti-LGBTQ law. I was wondering if the U.S. has any reaction to the court ruling and whether this will have any um, implications on policy toward Uganda, including potentially more sanctions. So the United States continues to be deeply troubled by uh, human rights abuses in uh, Uganda and by the Anti-Homosexuality Act. We believe that law undermines the human rights, uh, prosperity, and welfare of all Ugandans. The Ugandan government's failure to safeguard the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons is part of the broader degradation of human rights protections that puts in, uh, all in Uganda at risk and damages the country's uh, reputation abroad. And with respect to United States actions, so um, we have already imposed sanctions, including a visa restriction policy. We have ended Uganda's eligibility for the African Growth and Opportunity Act, curtailed direct government-to-government -government funding uh, to programs implemented with Uganda, um, uh, issued a business advisory, a travel advisory, and advocate, advocated for Uganda's full compliance with the social safeguards it agreed to in the World Bank lending, uh, in World Bank lending, and we will continue to take uh, all appropriate measures. And just uh, just a very brief follow-up on that. I mean, it's not the only place in Africa where this is happening. Ghana, there's, there's still a the debate there. I mean, is, is there a concern about a broader push against uh, LGBTQ equality in, in Africa, and, and particularly in Ghana? Is there any, is there any communication on that with the, with the Ghanaians? So yeah, we are deeply concerned by legislation under consideration elsewhere in Africa and globally. It's not just in Africa that targets uh, LGBTQI plus persons and their allies. We believe that governments should protect the uh, all individuals in their countries and that every person uh, uh, deserves full dignity and that these laws, whether they be in Africa or anywhere else in the world, undermine the human rights, prosperity, and welfare of individuals uh, and risk damaging their country's reputation abroad. Okay. We'll go ahead and then I'll come to, I'll come to you. Uh, would you have a comment on the earthquake in Taiwan, the worst in 25 years? Uh, I would say first uh, and foremost, we um, express our deepest condolences on behalf of the United States to the um, at least nine people dead and 900 injured and their families and everyone uh, who was affected. We stand ready to support uh, the people of Taiwan at this difficult time. USAID staff in the region uh, and here in Washington will continue to closely monitor the earthquake and tsunami warnings and will remain in close contact 
with the uh, American Institute in uh, Taiwan and are ready to provide uh, assistance if necessary. Also, with the uh, AIT chairperson now in Taipei, uh, would you have a message ahead of the inauguration next month of Taiwan's president-elect? Uh, I would say that the chair will meet during this trip with a range of senior Taiwan leaders, political figures, and scholars from across party lines to discuss continued U.S.-Taiwan collabor collaboration on issues of mutual interest such as regional security, a mutually beneficial trade and investment, and people-to-people -people educational and cultural ties, but broadly U.S. policy has not changed. We have a long-standing rock-solid partnership with Taiwan, and we look forward to continuing that unofficial relationship through the Taiwan political transition. Um, on equality, the secretary announced a new chief DEI officer yesterday, but there's criticism both internally and outside of state on why this took so long. The position was vacant for 10 months and doesn't require Senate confirmation. So why did it take so long if this is such a top priority for the secretary? So we were working to find the best possible candidate, and we believe we did find the best possible candidate. Uh, oftentimes when it comes to these jobs, um, you have to go through um, uh, uh, difficult bureaucratic procedures to fill basic positions, um, but I will say the, folk, the emphasis that the secretary has put on this job has not wavered and has put on this issue has not wavered throughout that time and that our work to uh, expand diversity uh, has continued since the outset of this administration um, because the secretary believes that having a workforce that reflects America and all of its diversity makes us stronger and improves our national security. And we look forward to um, uh, working this, with this new uh, diversity offer, uh, officer to expand the work that we are already doing. And we'll take one more and then wrap for the day. Thank you, sir. Uh, an Indian internal investigation has found the involvement of the intelligence officials into the assassination attempt on six liter Group of Singh in New York. Uh, according to Indian media, that report is also shared with the State Department. Do you have any response on that? Because you were also waiting for that since long. So I'm not going to speak to, to media reports. Uh, I will just say that we have made clear to the government of India that we want to see them uh, conduct a full investigation. And uh, we continue to look forward to the results of that investigation, but I don't have any updates to offer. So according to some media reports, the United Nations has delivered more than $2.9 billion in cash to Afghanistan since the Taliban seized control, resulting in the flow of US funds to the extremist group. So, so, sir, is this happening with the consultation of U.S. government or? No, no, not at all. So let me make, make clear that we require all of our partners to have safeguards in place to ensure that assistance reaches those who need it. Uh, we also require robust monitoring and reporting from partner organizations implementing assistance programs, including those in unstable and unfriendly environments. When there is cause for concern related to the delivery of uh, assistance. We have plans and protocols in place to respond, and we will continue to monitor all of our assistance programs and seek to mitigate the risk that U.S. assistance could indirectly benefit the Taliban or could be diverted to unintended risks. In response to the President Biden's letter, Pakistani Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has said that Pakistan is willing to work with the U.S. for global peace and regional prosperity. What support can U.S. offer Pakistan in addressing security threats from neighboring countries and combating the Pakistani Taliban? So we will continue to work uh, to um, expand the security partnership between the United States and, and Pakistan. We have spoke, spoken to that uh, a number of times from this, uh, from this podium. It's been a priority for us, uh, and will continue to be so. And with that, I'll wrap for today. Thanks.